The laboratory is kind of the manifestation of human beings' interest in exploration. So in the past, it was a matter of setting sail on the oceans or exploring uh, the dark continent or whatever, you know, whatever kind of uh, description. And it was always couched in terms of mystery and adventure and challenge and a lot of times personal hardship. So uh, the reason why we're fond of astronauts is because you've got real people who are, are putting their lives on the line, literally, to some extent. In the case of uh, robotic exploration, uh, although there's no personal risk involved, there's a lot of emotional risk. So one of the reasons why you see people so tense before a major mission event like a landing or a launch or something else is because they've worked personally and uh, invested a lot of themselves into the project for, in some cases, many years. And it all boils down to a single event where it could fail for reasons that have nothing to do with their level of effort uh, and it's all over. So one of the reasons why they're so worried uh, beforehand is because they kind of feel in the, the past years uh, uh, of investment. And the reason why they're so happy is because it worked and also because it means we can then proceed to do what we uh, expected and what we designed. Well, one of the things that we've got going in our favor is that uh, people tend to be inspired in some fashion to go into engineering or science. So they may have been inspired by the space program or by something completely different, or maybe they had a robotics program at their school and they just liked the hands-on tinkering or writing the software code or whatever it might have been. So they've gone on to pursue technical degrees of one sort or another, and then they're attracted to NASA for any one of a variety of reasons. I mean, one thing to consider is that NASA is in round numbers, maybe about 25,000 people. Well, there's several hundred thousand people working for the aerospace contractors and companies that support the work that we do. So there's lots of ways to work on the space program without being part of NASA or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But these, uh, they, maybe they come just because it's a job that's offered that seems to be interesting or they like Southern California or whatever it might be. Uh, I've heard people who have made decisions for, for uh, you know, the weather and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, so much for that. Um, it, but it's interesting work. It's challenging work. And I think... It's not that it requires a special temperament to do this kind of work. It's kind of it, what it requires instead is the, the technical skill to be able to do it effectively. Of course, that's for any job. And then the uh, kind of bigger appreciation that it's something that is of national interest and something that's kind of at the heart of what humans uh, endeavor to do. And that as an individual, you get to play a part in that. So it's something bigger than the particular widget you happen to be designing or manufacturing. You're designing a widget that's going to go to another planet or explore the our planet from space or whatever it might be. And that has its own kind of intrinsic value. I'd say there's another angle too which is interesting for the generation that's entering the workforce now and that they've grown up since 2001 and 9-11. And so they have a different view than uh, perhaps their parents or older people regarding um, the work in defense. So the technologies that we have for the space program are part uh, uh, exploration but similar technologies are used by the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security and many students nowadays probably view it as a contribution they can make to the safety and security of the United States. So in the past they might have uh, decried uh, militarism or something like that. Um, maybe today they have a little bit more of a homeland security focus and are willing to do work that's challenging from a STEM point of view even if it's not exploring the solar system. Well, NASA's got an extraordinary uh, opportunity and then it has an obligation as a consequence because uh, the work that we do is public, it's civilian, it's taxpayer funded, and we want it out there where everyone can see it. So when we have events like the Curiosity landing on Mars uh, last August, it's, it's an event that not only could you, we, we encouraged everyone to stay up late on Sunday night or on the East Coast, get up early on Monday morning and actually watch and participate. And we put it out through lots of different types of media so it was, it was easy. And we have a rover on Mars, we have two rovers on Mars that actually tweet. So there's plenty of, of opportunity and exchange so people can participate in exploration themselves. So if you go back to ancient times or not so ancient times, people disappeared in ships and sometimes they were never heard, heard from again. But under the best possible circumstance, maybe it was a year or two before they came back with a story or whatever it might have been. Now we have the kind of real-time connections that, uh, that we can make. So we can engage people actively in exploration. Yeah, here's an example uh, of, uh, of a 21st century artifact, for lack of a better word. So this is actually a spare wheel from the Mars Exploration Rover. It's got its own property tag. It's got serial number 007. 
So one through six are actually on the surface of Mars. So this is, this is a, spare, a spare wheel. And uh, it's a, a piece of aluminum, a single billet of aluminum that's been milled down. And then the hub and the, tit and the flexures here are made out of titanium. And uh, there's uh, some holes here that have the advantage of being able to shed rocks and soil that get inside the wheels. They also stamp a pattern out on the surface. So after a drive, we can look back and we can count the number of wheel rotations that it's made. And coincidentally, it actually also spells out JPL in Morse code. Really? Yes. Don't put your head in front of the camera. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so this pattern here is, uh, is JPL in Morse code. Um, it didn't have to be that way, but, but that's the way it is. Uh, but the wheel is, th there's no single answer as to what a Mars rover wheel ought to be or ought to look like. So this right here is, you know, it's a piece of aluminum with some titanium on the inside, but it's a pretty highly engineered device. So the, the Mars rovers themselves represent literally millions of decisions that were made correctly by talented and creative engineers that got good educations not only in the science and math areas, but also somehow in the idea of how to think out of the box, uh, think, think creatively to work individually, but also work in teams and kind of um, know that there's no one right answer, but there's lots of wrong answers, and no one knows what the right answer is until they figure it out. So there's coaching and mentoring and things like that, but it's not driving anyone to the correct answer. So this wheel is, is not only an interesting piece of technology and relating to something that's actively going on Mars today, but it's kind of also a metaphor for the way the kind of challenging pro uh, problems that we face in STEM uh, work. Uh, there's no correct answer. Uh, it's up to you to figure it out. No one's ever done this kind of work before. Whenever we have an event like Curiosity or the Endeavor uh, coming to the California Science Center, um, obviously people come out of their houses, they'll stay up late, they'll, they'll, they'll participate in those events at some level. What they need to do is stay engaged, stay involved, and go to the website, follow the progress, go see Endeavor when it goes on display and see the exhibits that surround that. Uh, there's images from the Mars rover, raw images that come down every single day. You know, you can go ahead and visit them when you want to do that. and, and uh, uh, kind of say, well, what's the rover doing today? There's answers to those questions out there to participate. In terms of the educational environment to really support this, um, the focus on English language arts and mathematics is important. Those are very important skills. But they've been very successful in squeezing out a broad integrated curriculum and siloing the things for which testing is very, very important. So as a STEM educator, my advocacy is actually not for, let's do more STEM. Let's, you know, let's get that science back in the curriculum. It's to really create a much broader group of students in terms of their educational experience who have had English language arts and are not just learning to read, but are reading literature and they're especially reading science fiction. So they're getting that kind of broad, expansive view of, uh, of horizons beyond their own horizon, literally. And they're learning the math skills, but they're learning them in the context of scientific and engineering kinds of problems. And they're taking social studies, and they're taking the arts, and they're taking physical education, and they're being graduated from high school having had a 12-year or 13-year career of being whole students educated in a wide range of, of areas. And the reason is that none of us are really functional in society if we can only do one thing. So if you have people that are great at, at mathematics but cannot do anything else, that's the you know, classic definition of nerd, which we you know, cherish at NASA, don't get me wrong, but uh, we're looking for people in society to help society run that have a broad understanding of all the issues of society. Mm -hmm. And so the students that I speak with and interact with and their teachers, very few of the students themselves are actually going to go into STEM careers. Uh, very few of them are going to become scientists or become engineers. Some of them will, but very, very few in terms of statistically. All of them are going to become citizens of the state of California, their local municipalities in the United States, and they're going to be asked to vote on issues that have an undercurrent of science or technology to it. So if you look at any particular ballot measure or the other issues we're asked to discuss, so whether it's, it's genetically modified food, high-speed rail, clean air, clean water, uh, any of these issues have a science and technology component to it. And you cannot really address those effectively unless you have two things. One is kind of an analytical habit of mind to be able to look at the issues and the broader sociological perspective of how these fit into society. So it's not just all about science and mathematics as far as I'm concerned. It's really about having an integrated educational environment that includes all the subjects, all the subjects, all the students every year 
so that by the time they graduate high school, they're ready to be citizens, whether they go on to university education or not, and uh, that they become effective voters and intelligent voters, and they're not just voting based on the last TV ad they saw or some emotional argument.